Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, thank, thanks to the uh, ERF for the invitation, which I appreciate enormously, especially to Ibrahim. Uh, I've known Ibrahim from a very long time um, in his previous incarnation at uh, the ARC, the African Economic Research Consortium, in which we've uh, both long been uh, active. So it's, it's great to see you again, Ibrahim. I'm supposed to talk a little bit about the uh, African experience. Now, that's going to be easy because Jim yesterday already did most of my work because he put the facts out there. And so I don't need to uh, do that. And Andre has just given you a very clear story about um, the European experience. I will refer a few times to that uh, because there's a tendency in the discussions on regional integration to think that the experience from one block are uh, going to be relevant to another block. And I'll, I'll give you a few warning signals from what happened in, in Africa for why that might not be true. OK, the African experience. It goes back a long way. Uh, Samir, you, you said 1960s. Well, they started talking about it even in the 1950s, when most of the continent still consisted of colonies. So even, even before the process of decolonization, there was this idea that uh, you needed um, uh, a, a process of regional integration. They were not, on this point, they were certainly not very clear on objectives. But there was this vague feeling that if you are a big continent full of countries, which in economic terms very small, you needed to uh, work together. Basically, that was it. And if you'd pushed them, they would have emphasized uh, trade uh, integration as the, uh, as the main point. Okay, uh, it became, region integration quickly became a, an important uh, political point and it became uh, a, uh, enshrined in the uh, Charter of the uh, Organization of African uh, Unity. Um, what happened next was basically the period of import substitution. Africa followed these policies uh, like other developing uh, countries, and it saw uh, trade blocks in that light. If you were going to have a policy, economic policy of um, import substitution, you needed a bigger market than these very small economies. That was the prime reason for uh, regional blocks. The um, um, Abuja agreement then became very ambitious, looking forward to uh, 2025 and saying, by then, with the whole continent should be uh, uh, covered by, by a pan-African uh, economic community. Uh, 2025 is, of course, uh, of course pretty close, and, and we're not nearly uh, there. Um, this is the initiative. This is basically the experience, and Jim has talked about it yesterday. If you look at what happened in Africa, it's just a bewildering number of arrangements, treaties, sometimes very formal, sometimes less formal, um, which, I have to be careful, often lacked substance. A very, in, in many cases, it was a ceremony, the presidents got together, a treaty was signed, and then nothing very much happened. Um, a big problem was that membership of these arrangements of, often overlapped. Well, you've just heard from, from André, if, if you have a free trade arrangement, you then get a, uh, a problem of rules of origin, and that certainly became a very complicated problem in some of the African blocs. Um, Intra-block trade, unlike the numbers you've just seen for Europe, remained and remains very, very low. And there's a big discussion still going on in literature on the reasons for that. So here, here are three possible reasons. One is, is the simple one. If you, if you don't implement the treaty, you shouldn't expect any results. And that's probably the most important answer. The second one is, don't expect intra-regional trade when transport costs are very, very high. And this 
It's not relevant for your region, but in Africa that's a fundamental problem. Uh, transport costs within the region are just enormous. Uh, people have often made this point that getting a car from Japan to Africa, um, that costs about uh, $1,500 if you go to East Africa. If you then want to get to the other side of the continent, um, that's about 5000 So that's just an enormous barrier to, uh, to trade. And the final point is a, is a fundamental one. Is there really a trade potential if we are putting together um, countries with, in many cases, very similar comparative advantage, then don't expect a big change in trade. Okay, so it's not a happy story. Uh, people have started with uh, enthusiasm and the experience has been disappointing. A new development which I want to spend a little bit of time on is um, something which started around 2000, the idea that you should have regional blocks within Africa and link them to um, the um, um, European Union, so north-south blocks in the uh, jargon. Um, the original idea, many people have forgotten that, was to use that as a lock-in device. So the idea was there's a reforming government, African government, it wants to liberalize its trade and keep it open and it will obviously face domestic opposition from domestic producers and to lock in its liberalized policies it uh, needs a link to the EU which it will lose if it will reverse its policies. So going back on trade reform would become very costly and that would be uh, the reason why uh, you, could, uh, you would remain the liberal uh, policies. So the, the role of the, of the North, of the EU in this case, would basically to threaten punishment, namely losing the access, um, but not for any bad reasons, but to help the reforming government. Okay, that was the original idea. It became quickly something quite different and, very con and it became very controversial. The African countries started complaining that what the EU had on the table was not very valuable to them. The idea of lock-in disappeared and what was on the table was access to uh, the European market which was very little additional to what they already had. So the offer didn't look very attractive. On the other hand, if you think in mercantilist terms, on the other hand, the uh, EU uh, claimed access to uh, African uh, markets, that was the whole idea, and there was a big debate then about how quickly that access should be uh, implemented. There are now long adjustment periods, so the thing doesn't mean very much in practice. Uh, the process is fantastically slow. Huh? So the, the discussion started in the late uh, 1990s, it gained speed around 2000, and now this is the situation. Huh? Recently, an agreement uh, which is called the stepping stone, so there's still some way to go, signed with uh, Ghana. So an unhappy experience, and I'm relating the story because I, I think it's a good example of not thinking through very carefully what it is you want and why. It's similar to a point which uh, André has made. Okay. We all know that trade blocks may reduce your welfare, and that's of course some of the theory we've learned as students. I want to go quickly through some of those points because I'm, I, th I think they're relevant to what happened in Africa. Okay, this is what we all learned as students, that a preferential arrangement implies trade diversion. You switch some of your imports from the uh, more efficient to a less efficient producer, and that may uh, cause a uh, welfare loss for the block as a whole. A variant on that is if you, if you leave the standard model, uh, which has constant um, um, marginal cost, and you go to increasing marginal cost, then you get a, quite a different story. Um, I want to stress that because it's a good way of thinking about what happens in small, 
trade blocks. If you uh, put a few small African economies together, and trade diversion means that one is going to expand its, uh, let's say, industrial production, uh, that is unlikely to happen at constant marginal cost. This is not the standard diagram we've all learned where the import faces horizontal supply curves. It will be an upward sloping supply curve. Why does that matter? Okay, let me just give an example. Uh, so we have a, uh, a, a block, the East African community, that actually consists of three countries, but I'll focus on, on two, um, uh, Tanzania and Kenya. Now, suppose the trade diversion means that Tanzania is what it used to uh, import partly from Europe, is now going to uh, uh, import from Kenya, but not all. So the marginal supplier is still the, uh, the rest of the world, let's say, Europe or America. Okay, for Tanzania, they, they, they're going to lose. They're going to lose because the tariff revenue, which they uh, initially got from the, uh, the trade with Kenya, now disappears in the block. And normally that would be offset by an increase in consumer surplus. Now it isn't. Why is it not offset? Because prices don't change. So why don't prices change? Because the marginal supplier is still the rest of the world. So you don't get an increase in consumer surplus. You do get this loss. Um, Tanzania gets a gain, and it is not very difficult to show that the, uh, in aggregate, the block has a loss. So this is something we have to worry about. As soon as we drop the standard assumption, constant marginal cost, we get a striking result. Uh, a welfare loss is not only possible, it is necessary. Okay. Fiscal and distributional problems, the heading of this sheet, is what I am most worried about and, and the lesson which I want you uh, to leave you uh, with. Loss of tariff revenue is something which um, African governments in debates with the World Bank, the IMF, have often stressed as a major problem. They're right. These are simple fiscal structures where tariff revenue is often a very large part of, of government revenue. And therefore, even if you want to liberalize trade, uh, you must think very carefully about the fiscal implications of that. What is going to replace this sort of government revenue? I think donors missed a great opportunity there. They basically dismissed this argument, which they shouldn't have. They could have used aid. This would have been a very good use of aid by a temporary offsetting um, this loss of revenue as um, uh, African governments build up fiscal systems. Just denying the problem is not very helpful. And um, a possible lesson for this region is think very carefully about what integration implies for your fiscal structures. Then, unequal division of the spoils. This happens in every block. In every block you form, people will start talking about who gains most. And what matters here is not so much reality, but the perception. There may be a perception that uh, my country is not necessarily losing, but not gaining as much as another country. That creates a political problem which may undermine the integration effort. Here's an example, the um, collapse of the, I should say, the first East African community in 1977. That was uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. And uh, the perception, I think rightly, uh, in, um, in Tanzania was that Kenya was running away with most of the benefits. That became an enormous uh, problem. The union collapsed. It collapsed in the most spectacular way Namely, Tanzania actually closed the border with uh, um, uh, Tanzania closed the border with uh, Kenya and Kenya. Okay. Now let's see. This is Andre's point about convergence. How we can think about convergence in in uh, terms of a block like the East African Community, which is different from history. So here it is. We've we've just seen the example. Uh, uh, I had ten, uh, Tanzania 
was importing from the rest of the world and from Kenya. Kenya is within this block the richer country. It is benefiting from the uh, trade diversion. And um, so we see the richer country is gaining, the poorer country, in this example, Tanzania, is losing. So it's a very clear case of divergence. The effect of the block is the opposite of Andre's uh, picture. Here, you actually have an effect of the two, of the two countries growing apart. It's not a reason, I'm not arguing that that is uh, a reason for not doing it, but you should think very carefully about it. Eh? If these effects are big, they easily may derail the whole project. And again, it's not reality which matters here, it is the perception. So even if the effects are small, if people think they're big, that is the problem you have to deal with. Okay, so this is what I just said in, in more technical terms. Within a south-south block, as in my uh, East African uh, example, if I have this order of things, uh, country A and B and the rest of the world, and they're getting more capital intensive and richer in that order, then the block is going to be ex at the expense of, of A, that is the, the poorer country, and that implies divergence. North-north is just the opposite. There, the, if that is a rich block in the sense of more capital intensive, higher incomes than the rest of the world, then the country which is gaining from the trade diversion within the block is the poorer member of the block. Think, think about what that means. So here, it's not the, the Kenyas which are going to gain from the block. It's exactly the opposite. It's the poorer country which will be lifted up, and in relative terms, the richer country which is staying behind. That is the process of convergence which I think is, is in, in partly an explanation for the picture you've seen, the, the very dramatic um, uh, convergence of the European Union uh, compared to what we've seen in, in Africa, which is very different. Okay. Um, I stress that because this has been known in literature for, for quite some time, and it's sort of faded away again. People are not uh, worried anymore about these distributional effects, but I think they are important. Okay. Um, commitment. The, um, I think the divergence is something which leads to um, undermining of the political commitment. And we've also seen that the regional bloc cannot well function as a agency of restraint. For that, you need a credible threat. In the case of the European Union, the credible threat wasn't there because there wasn't much access to lose. So if you want to use that argument, um, it's not very attractive. I'll skip that and go to the conclusion. Um, you need, again, something André has already said. You require very strong commitment in the case of the European Union, he, he did not stress that. The commitment was the experience of World War II. That is what was behind the Treaty of Rome and which enabled people to overstep their natural reservations. I certainly don't want to argue that you need a war, but you do need a very strong political commitment. It has been lacking in many of the um, African initiatives. And secondly, and my last point, you really need strong states, strong in the sense, not, not in the military sense, but in the sense of a well-organized, informed bureaucracy. And that is because you have to deal with these very complicated fiscal and distributional effects. If you're not able to do that, it's going to be a mess. So. My message is, don't get started unless you have a well-organized state. Thank you very much.